radar and different radar controllers in different locations were reporting position points to a central area and someone in that central command was plotting these positions on a map. Someone made an error in reporting these coordinates or reporting the numbers and when they plotted it, they showed that the two aircraft had in fact moved into the same area, in fact had merged and then separated. Did the Soviets confuse the two airplanes and target the wrong one? Could anyone familiar with aviation mistake a Boeing 747 for a 707? Well, there are numerous superficial similarities in that they're both uh, large, swept-wing, four-engine, low-wing jet transports. Both airplanes were just unpainted natural aluminum on the bottom of the wings and the bottom of the fuselage, so the coloration would be similar. If the Soviet fighter planes approached the suspicious aircraft from behind and below, they would have seen an outline similar to a 707's, and a 707 converted into an RC-135 was what they were expecting to find. In order to clearly identify the plane, the fighter pilot would have had to approach it from the side, allowing him to see the distinctive hump of the 747. Do we have any indication that the Russian fighter pilot did that? In the case of the shoot-down, he transmitted back to his controllers several interesting pieces of information, but nothing that lets us know for sure that he had identified it as an airliner or a 747. Retired Soviet Army General Anatoly Kornikov was the chief commander of air defense for Sakhalin Island. We discovered an unidentified plane heading towards Sakhalin. Raiders were activated and interceptor pilots ready in their cockpits. Soon we could identify the plane. It was still far away. I immediately decided to launch interceptors on duty into the air. Lieutenant Colonel Gennady Osipovich was one of the fighter pilots sent to intercept the intruder. I took off, they gave me the course immediately, northeast, because the plane was coming from the north, from Kamchatka. At first, I didn't expect it to be a military flight, but then they told me to activate my weapons and aim them at this target. General Kornikov says every effort was made to identify the aircraft. We were making sure that the flashing uh, navigation lights were on. The pilot said, yes, the flashing lights are working. A flashing light indicates that a plane is carrying civilian passengers. But apparently this did not convince the Soviet general. But to... Judging by the shadow and configuration, he said it looked like an RC-135. I reported that I was ready to fire. No, they said, wait, don't shoot, don't fire your missiles. Approach his altitude and force the plane to land. In other words, they really didn't want to destroy it. I approached its altitude about 10,200 meters with readiness and I started to flash my warning lights. This is a well-known international signal. You are in violation. I did it again, but again he didn't answer. I reported that he wasn't reacting. They told me, fire warning shots from your cannons. I moved even closer to it and shot first in a direction like this, parallel to its flight path. I fought about four rounds of warning shots and turned a little and fired another shot. And again, there was absolutely no reaction and no transmission from it. The Soviets had to make a decision. The Boeing 747 was nearing Sakhalin Island, home to six military airfields and the gateway to the Pacific Ocean for the Soviet fleet. The plane was already approaching the island west coast. When I reported that the plane is absolutely not reacting and it's flying over our base, they gave me the order to destroy the plane. The crew of KAL-007 were oblivious. What happened during the last dreadful moments of the flight? Did the Soviets cover up their part in the tragedy? Did the Su-15 fighter pilot warn the Korean 747 before firing his missiles? And where was the plane when it was hit? Over Soviet territory or in international waters? The fate of Korean Airlines Flight 007 was sealed once it strayed into Soviet airspace. But what actually took place in those last few crucial moments?
As a Soviet fighter closed in on KAL-007, Korean passenger plane made an unexpected move. It began to climb from 10,000 meters to 10,700 meters. To the Soviet Su-15 pilot, the aeroplane appeared to be taking evasive action. Right at that moment, something changed. No time for reasoned analysis about why that change might have happened. It's just noticing that, oh no, it's not maintaining a stable he's flight path He's seen me and he's, he's pulling a trick. The Soviet fighter pilot, Gennady Osipovich, got into position and fired his two missiles. The left rocket is heat-seeking through infrared, and the right rocket is radar-guided. I didn't see the impact of the heat-seeking one, but the radar-guided I saw. Because you shoot it, and then you have to aim it by sighting it with beam, so it does not go off and self-destruct. I saw it explode right under the tail, near the stabilizer. I reported that the target was destroyed and returned to my airbase. Did both Soviet missiles strike the 747? It's not known. Right after impact, you can see that the nose begins to pitch up Airplane starts a climb. At the same time, the crew is making very large inputs of the control wheel to try to oppose this, and it's not being very effective. Well, pitch control all comes from the tail. So since there was an excursion in pitch, we can be fairly confident that something happened to the tail. The cockpit voice recorder chronicled the flight crew's reaction. That's on the voice recorder. Someone says, what's that? The airplane begins to pitch up. Nose down, okay, you're losing back over. You should be losing the hydraulics about now. The missile or missiles had destroyed the hydraulic controls, the plane's nervous system. We know that the engines were still operating normally from the flight recorder. The only change is this point here where the pilot himself reduced power in an effort to control this climb. We also have a verbal comment that was recorded by the cockpit voice recorder in which the flight engineer or the second officer advised the captain after the missile strike that all four engines were normal. Looking back here, we can imagine what they couldn't see or didn't, never knew. The tail is scrap metal. An extra drag in the tail is jerking the tail back, pulling the nose up. Meantime, with all the scrap back there and the damage, the hydraulic lines going through the tail are all now bleeding. We're about to lose all four of our hydraulic systems. All the hydraulic fluid to be lost, and if that happens, the airplane's pretty much uncontrolled. A minute later, the cockpit recording stops. I don't think that the concept of an attack would have ever occurred to him. I don't think they lived long enough to really think it through and, and uh, even grasp the idea that they might have been hit by a missile. But 10 minutes passed before the passenger jet struck the water at over 1,100 kilometers per hour. All 269 people on board were killed. Korean Airlines Flight 007 was totally destroyed. Osipovich insists he fired several warning shots at the jetliner. But did the fighter pilot know that he was tracking a passenger plane? First of all, I didn't have time to figure out what kind of plane it was. I was the only one in the cockpit, and a plane is not a car. For one person to navigate, to aim weapons, to observe everything, and at the same time figure out if it is a civilian plane or whether it is waving at me friendly. I had only one goal. I was basically aiming, how to say, to kill. This is what I learned. Osipovich was following orders, as he had been trained to do. But whether he followed recognized international procedures is a matter of debate. The international accepted procedure is for the fighters to come up alongside, make visual contact with the crew, 
to alert them by either flashing their lights or firing cannons. The fighters that were sent up to uh, intercept Korean Air did not follow the international procedures for interception and identification. This is the actual audio recording of the radio conversation between Osipovich and his commanding officer in the minutes leading up to the firing of his missiles. I flashed warning lights, meaning you are trespassing. I shot four rounds more than 250 shells from cannons. We have more than 500. I didn't see the shells. They had to see the flashes from the barrel. They are big at night. Everyone could see it. We used all possible means to let them know they were trespassing. Commands from the ground, from the air, by blinking lights, by warning shots from the cannons. But if so, why didn't KAL 007 see the warning shots? It's possible that the Korean plane had started its climb to 10,700 meters just before Osipovich fired. The warning shots could have passed beneath the 747, out of the Korean crew's line of sight. And another mystery remains. Where exactly was the Korean plane when it was attacked? The Soviets claimed that the incident occurred in their airspace, but some insist KAL-007 had re-entered international airspace. This is a detailed map of the search areas. Where was the plane found? Right here, X marks the spot where the wreckage was located. It's interesting to note that if you trace the 12-mile limit around Monoran Island and the 12-mile limit off the west coast of Sakhalin, it is definitely in international waters. The report from the first investigation by the ICAO the International Civil Aviation Organization, was released in 1984. It was inconclusive. Two crucial pieces of evidence were missing, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorders, the so-called black boxes. The cockpit voice recorder does just what the name implies. It records all the sounds and all the voices that occur on the flight deck so that investigators can listen in and to hear what's going on. Not until 1992, Two years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, did Russia's first president, Boris Yeltsin, allow access to KAL 007's black boxes. The flight data recorder was missing for almost 10 years, finally turned over to ICAO in 1992. When we were able to see these traces right here and all the rest of the data on the flight data recorder, finally, for the first time, we could have a much better idea of exactly what happened aboard Korean Air 007 that night. To confirm where KAL-007 fell into the sea, our experts employed a state-of-the-art search and rescue program called SARMAP. Software designer Owen Howlett and oceanographer Malcolm Spaulding worked backwards, calculating where the jumbo jet hit the water from information about the debris. Both tides and currents cause items in the water to move in predictable ways. We have some indication about where the debris was found.